Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Yichui. I'm a professor of material science right here. It's a great pleasure to host today's event. Uh, I'd like to welcome all of you from around the world. And thank you for joining us for today's uh, Stanford Global Energy Dialogue. Um, Sally Benson and I will jointly host today's dialogue. As you know, Sally uh, Benson and together with uh, Alu Majanda were the recent directors of Preco Institute for Energy. It, it's my great honor to uh, take over the post from these two outstanding uh, scientists. Um, with uh, a little bit more background about today's conversation, uh, one of the most striking features of today's uh, energy and climate landscape is how the corporate world is making climate commitment and thereby using its role in society to address the climate change problem. According to a study by Natural Capital Partners, as of September 2019, roughly 25% of Fortune 500 global companies had made some kind, some kind of commitment with 2030 or 2050 goals of the $32 trillion of total revenues of Fortune 500 companies, ones that have made climate commitment add up to about $10 trillion, roughly half of the US GDP, just to give you a perspective. By all means, this is a massive movement, which is likely to grow in the next decade. What impact would this have on the world? How can industry transformation drive change and will it move the needle on the global carbon footprint? Now, let me pass this to um, Sally to introduce uh, Kara Hurst a little bit. So it's great to be here and to address these issues. We're really fortunate to have a very special guest, uh, Kara Hurst, who's the vice president of worldwide sustainability at Amazon, where her work involves addressing carbon reduction efforts through Amazon's enterprise social and environmental external engagement and uniting the industry in a pledge around carbon reduction. In 2019, Amazon co-founded the Climate Pledge, a commitment to be net zero carbon across the business by 2040 and has pledged $2 billion towards investing in companies creating products, services and technologies to protect the planet. So we're looking forward to a really uh, terrific conversation with Kara. So thank you for joining us. Um, as always, we like to uh, warm, uh, warm up the audience with a little quiz. So the quiz is according to Amazon sustainability commitment, how many electric vans will Amazon have on the road by 2030? Okay, so your choices are 1,000, 100,000, 500,000 or a million. So let's take a let's take a look at what you said. Okay. Oh my goodness, our audience is getting to be so knowledgeable. Okay. So uh, a lot of you know it's not one thousand. Um, actually, the single largest answer was one hundred thousand, uh, which is uh, which is the right number. Anyway, so you're all too smart. Okay. So let's go on to your second quiz. What percent of Amazon's worldwide electricity consumption comes from renewable energy resources? So 7%, uh, 26%, 42%, or 75%. Okay, so, uh, so let's pull up what, uh, what you all think about that. Okay, hmm, all right. Well, most of you thought it was 26%, but actually not. Um, uh, in 2019, Amazon reported that 42% of its um, uh, electricity came from uh, renewable uh, sources. Okay, so already on a terrific path to progress there. So just for audience to uh, know, to build out the background, I think the conversation today is uh, very timely. Um, so looking at the overall, the whole world right now, uh, the uh, US right here, we have a uh, new government supporting clean energy. Uh, we are back to a uh, Paris Accord. And, uh, and the private investment, certainly there's a lot of uh, capitals going in to invest in uh, clean energy. And so these numerous companies 
uh, including Amazon, is uh, you know really buying into the uh, fighting the climate change. So with all this background, it's a very exciting time for myself as a Stanford faculty, and also I'm sure for our students. I know for my for my graduate students, they're very excited about uh, what they can do to help to speed up this process to fight the climate change. Let me start by uh, uh, asking Kara the first question. Kara, I have set up the, uh, all the background for you. Now the audience is already warm up to uh, ready to get engaged, but uh, let's Sally and I have a few questions for you first, just to further warm up everybody. Uh, Kara, um, the first question is, uh, well, let's start with the Amazon's commitment to a net zero business. Can you describe the climate pledge for our audience? You know, we, we saw, saw this in the news all the time about climate back, uh, a pledge. Well, introduce that a little bit. What does the Amazon hope to achieve as an organization? And what have been some of your recent successes? Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, and, uh, you know, it's always a, a journey in this pandemic <laughs> to get everything working. So I appreciate all the patience, but it's really wonderful to be able to be here today. And thank you to Sally and Yi and the Stanford community and certainly the students uh, for uh, hosting this and allowing us to talk a little bit about our work. We're really excited about the Climate Pledge and really all of our sustainability initiatives at Amazon. So looking forward to this conversation today very much. Um, the Climate Pledge is our commitment to be net zero carbon by 2040. And I'll back up and maybe just talk a little bit about how that's come about and what that means to us. Um, we have been engaged in sustainability for a very long time at Amazon and looking across all of the different very complex businesses that we're in um, from fulfillment and logistics to our retail business, certainly our cloud computing business with AWS, and thinking about uh, you know, our studios business on and on as we expand and now into even physical stores. So um, as we looked at that and we were looking at where we really need to integrate sustainability into our business, how we operationalize that, we were also, as many of you have been as well, uh, thinking about the science, reading the IPCC reporting, uh, in dialogue with folks like yourselves and, and the scientific community to really understand um, what the you know what the world was telling us about what we're seeing and the fact that these devastating effects of climate change are not only happening uh, more rapidly but really that we think they're going to be more devastating uh, potentially that we had than we had realized and so as we were evolving the work that we were doing internally at Amazon. We were also thinking about how, um, what metrics do we need? What information do we need to collect? How could we go faster? And that culminated in a dialogue with our leadership about uh, a commitment for us that was an accelerated commitment 10 years ahead of the Paris Agreement to commit to 2040. And then we thought, you know, with the complexity of the businesses that we're in, the multiple different industries that we're in, um, we would love to invite others into this because one of the biggest things we know that we need is truly a transformation of systems, transformation of industries. Uh, we need to be sending those very strong signals collectively that we have a demand for products and services that will help us to decarbonize. And so bringing together other companies in this, um, we went out first and of course uh, partnered with Global Optimism, which is a group led by Tom Rivet Karnak and Christiana Figueres. Many of you will know Christiana. She was the architect of the Paris Agreement from 2015, the former UN climate chief. Um, and they work a lot across uh, the corporate sector in particular, but also NGOs to think about um, how these commitments can come together and really be substantive, credible, transparent, and operationalized within businesses. So we're very uh, lucky to have Christiana and, and Global Optimism along with us. and. Um, we set the intention in September 2019 for a climate pledge. It has three components to it. Uh, one is to um, map and measure report on a regular basis, GHG emissions. Uh, the second is to decarbonize, make real operational cha changes within business, uh, to decarbonize uh, business operations. 
things like renewable energy, energy efficiency, uh, electrification of fleet. And then um, the third is where companies cannot get to zero. And this is kind of a, a both and solution where they cannot get to zero um, to use natural climate solutions or offsets, but specifically the language is around them being real, credible, uh, socially beneficial, uh, permanent. So those words very much matter in how we look at those kinds of solutions. We also think investing in natural climate solutions is a necessary part um, of, you know, keeping our planet below 1.5. So I think there's a, a lot of uh, interesting rigor and um, kind of background to how those components, while they may be kind of simplified in those three things, are, are coming together for the pledge. Well, thank you, Kara. This is uh, fantastic. I, I, I would personally like to thank Amazon for playing a leadership role in this process. Now, let me pass to Sally. Okay, well, thanks for the terrific introduction to the Climate Pledge. <clears throat> and one of your goals was also to uh, engage other companies, and I believe 30 companies across a wide range of industries have joined you. And, you know, do you plan to work together to achieve your goals? And, and if so, how? That's a, it's a great question. Um, and, you know, this past year certainly um, has been <laughs> incredibly challenging uh, for so many of us. Um, you know, not to mention just the loss of life and what people have been grappling with in terms of uh, adapting to the situation. And I think it's really interesting and very important that climate remained a top priority uh, for many companies. And so when we launched this, obviously, as I was just describing in September 2019, we knew that climate was on the agenda for uh, many of our the corporate partners that we work with. Um, but of course, we didn't know what 2020 would bring. And I think the fact that we have an additional 30 organizations, and not just you know any organizations, but really large, impactful companies like Microsoft, Unilever, Best Buy, Verizon, Uber, JetBlue. We even have a, a football team uh, from Spain, Real Betis. So it's kind of a, a wide sector sectoral approach. Um, a lot of big companies that have come together and said, you know, we also see the need to take urban, urgent climate action. Um, and, you know, they're committing to this kind of transformational, uh, you know, decarbonization within their own operations, as I mentioned, but they're also um, thinking about what it means for their sector, they're thinking about uh, what it means for their supply chains and their value chains. And companies we're seeing with a lot of really complex physical infrastructure. I mean, what it means for a company like JetBlue to commit to this is amazing. Um, we have different paths for how we're all going to reach net zero because we require different things. But by agreeing to kind of those principal actions that I uh, was detailing previously, um, you know, we will meet those net zero commitments and I hope inspire um, others to come along with us. Um, we also have a number of partners. I mentioned global optimism before, but we thought it's very important, of course, to create, you know, a, a kind of a system or a collaboration of NGO partners in different areas to help support this. Um, we partnered with We Mean Business, which many of you will be familiar with, and we probably have a lot of members from We Mean Business because they work with over 1,200 companies. Um, they have, uh, you know, led by seven international nonprofit organizations and really about driving policy ambition to accelerate the zero carbon transition. Uh, groups like SBTI, the Science Based Targets Initiative, is part of this. And, and we encourage, we've joined SBTI, we encourage companies to set science based targets. Groups like Ceres that work a lot on um, policy. Um, We've also partnered with Race to Zero, which of course is important. It's a lead up to COP26 and thinking about how to accelerate across multiple different sectors. Um, we've partnered with TED Countdown, which is really focused on cutting, uh, many of you are familiar with TED, uh, certainly in all the TED Talks, and they're focused on cutting greenhouse gas emissions in half by 2030, um, creating a world that is safer and cleaner and more fair for everybody. So they're also focused on a wider uh, kind of target audience of, of the general population. Um, we have a new partnership that we recently announced with the Linux Foundation. And this is really to empower investors and banks, uh, insurers, companies, governments, NGOs, um, and academia with AI enhanced open source analytics and uh, open data to address climate risk. And this is um, an opportunity that's been supported by a number of companies uh, 
that have joined us as founding members, Allianz, uh, Microsoft, S&P Global. So those kinds of partnerships are very, very important to thinking about all of the different ways which we can partner together and meet the goals of the Climate Pledge. Okay, thank you. It's really, really encouraging uh, to hear. Uh, it also strikes me that, that all of you in um, pursuing these sustainability goals and the Climate Pledge, that there will be so many lessons learned and it would be great to find a way to share those, perhaps who don't have the same level of ambition as you, but nevertheless um, would be really important to also begin to the journey that, that you've already started and, and brought others along to, uh, to partner with. Uh, so Eve, back to you. Well, thank you, Sally. So Kara, um, just to well, I update you, I, I mentioned a little bit already, um, you know, well, Stanford has a very uh, comprehensive uh, energy ecosystem and research. Um, uh, since I, you know, took the post from Sally from Arun, I have been learning a lot about Stanford's energy program. So one area I'm learning is uh, to study how the company uh, would decarbonize, right? So Amazon is one of the companies I think is leading this. And, and I've been looking into how Amazon doing it. I mean, it's just fascinating. So, and, and through this process, certainly there's uh, one project uh, uh, you guys are doing uh, called Carbon System of Record Project. Can you tell us about this? Sure. Um, you know, I think what's interesting uh, and hopefully resonant with, um, with you and with a number of the companies that are joining us today and, and other organizations is that when we took a look at um, how we were going to think about our carbon footprint. Um, there had been already, you know, probably decades, if not 15 years of work that people were doing in looking at carbon. Um, there were certainly protocols set up um, that we refer to things like the GHG protocol, um, ISO, um, you know, other kinds of credible systems um, that allow kind of information to be codified and ways of reporting um, to be standardized. So we were aware of all that. We were, we've been building a team of climate scientists at Amazon um, for a number of years now. They're a phenomenal team. I'm so lucky to have them uh, working on this. And we kind of came together and said, you know, for it won't surprise anybody maybe who knows, who knows Amazon, how we operate. We're extraordinarily data-driven. Um, and we're also a tech company, so we like to uh, obviously use tech to build systems that are scalable. And so when we were thinking really hard about our carbon footprint, how we would not only understand it, map and measure it, but over time be able to give the partners in our business, our operators, uh, the business leads that we work with throughout the company an understanding of what this carbon footprint meant. I was extraordinarily passionate about the idea that having a carbon footprint as a static number um, that's just reported every year is not as useful and not as important um, to really being able to go deep and understand. So frankly, we took our time um, and over a number of years, uh, we worked really hard to build what we call, what you mentioned, a comprehensive carbon system of record, which is really uh, two different software uh, technologies that the team built. Uh, we're very lucky to also have software technologists uh, on our team, uh, software developer engineers, uh, and um, a whole you know, tech team that can do this for us. But it's a really sophisticated take. So we think it's, it's probably um, one of the more sophisticated ways to approach carbon that we've seen. So we are uh, building this system of record. We continue to iterate and build on it all the time, but it measures the sources of carbon across our business. Um, and then enables us to provide that data at a very granular level to each of the business owners um, to think about not only what is their current footprint, right? So what is this, what is it for, you know, a, a middle mile line haul trucking business? What is it for our last mile uh, fleet business? What is it for our Whole Foods business? Um, and we provide that data and allow them to see not only what it is in a, in a kind of numbers way, um, but information about what are the biggest levers that then they could begin to pull to decarbonize within their own business. And then most importantly, I think, operationalizing this conversation around carbon, which says, how do you think about integrating carbon into your decision-making? 
Um, so sustainability functions sit uh, sometimes in a silo in many companies. And while I run a central team that um, sits across all of Amazon, uh, integrating sustainability thinking into our businesses is incredibly important. Um, so when we talk about operationalizing how we do this, that carbon system of record, the granular level data that we get down to the shipment level, um, which is very, you know, it's, it's very useful data. We can really think about then when we make a decision, whether it's optimization and, and placement of inventory, or it's change in modality in one of our transportation networks, shifting modalities from, you know, a what ocean to rail or uh, one fleet to another. When we make those kinds of changes, it allows us to really understand the potential carbon impact of those changes. So it becomes an input to our decision making and a way to think about um, how we run our business. It's certainly not the determinant. Um, we have many other factors, safety, quality, timeliness, cost, like any business does. But what it does is it puts carbon and sustainability thinking into the way that our business leaders um, are really operating our business. And so for me, that's kind of going a number of steps further when you think about not just reporting out a carbon number, but really understanding from a kind of a grassroots level what that means for the business, what is it going to mean when we make changes, and it really makes sustainability kind of grow and scale within our, our company. Well, thank you, Kara. So I really like this approach from the big data angle. It really helps you to uh, figure things out. Uh, I'll digest this information a little bit. I might come back to, to that uh, later about this topic. Okay. Now let me pass on to Sally. Hi. Anyway, that, that was such a fantastic uh, description. And I must say that I think certainly from the perspective of Stanford University and thinking about our operations, I'm really jealous because I would love it if we could have uh, a similar system. Uh, and I'm sure many others do. So uh, you're really setting a, a great example there. Um, I wanna move on to another area of innovation. I know Amazon is known for innovation in so many domains and maybe thinking a little bit about the customer facing uh, domains uh, of Amazon. And that is that uh, deliveries, you know, the air freight, ground transportation, last mile delivery, uh, something that we all see in our engagement with Amazon and also packaging. Um, what are you doing uh, in terms of making these more sustainable? Yeah, great questions. Um, and we should go back and talk a little bit too about, you asked a question before about, you know, how are we sharing this knowledge and that carbon system of record that we built, the products, the services, the tools, we want to make them available to others. We do want them, you know, we're looking at how that um, can be uh, maybe more available. We're still kind of figuring it out ourselves, of course, and and all the ways in that works at Amazon, but that's that's a really important point. So I just didn't want to let that go, Sally. Um, but on the innovation and particularly our transportation, if you, if you look across our carbon footprint, um, it's you know it's not a surprise that our our transportation, our fulfillment networks, our operations are the biggest part of um, of that carbon footprint. And so we have really focused in there and we're working across those businesses to, again, utilize that information that we now have about what that footprint is, what the biggest levers are we can pull. Um, we set, in addition to the climate pledge, we set an interim goal because I think it's really important also to not, you know, to have a long-term vision, incredibly important to set that intention to go 10 years earlier than the Paris Agreement, incredibly important and frankly, really, really hard to do. But we also wanted to set uh, interim goals. And so one of those is we know that it's really important to our customers that they receive their items in the most sustainable manner possible. So we set a goal we called shipment zero, which is 50% of all of our shipments to be net zero carbon by 2030. And this is, you know, the fulfillment lanes of the package. So we have uh, internal language that we use, we would call it maybe um, you slam to step or pick to porch. So when an item's picked in our fulfillment network and is kind of picked, uh, packaged, transported and arrives to the customer, that part of it, we want to be um, at least at 50% net zero carbon by 2030. So that, that includes a number of things that you're talking about. And of course, the customer facing pieces of this. We also, uh, you know, I'm sure a number of you have seen uh, delivery vehicles on the roads in your communities. And um, we know it's really important, 
It's one of the biggest signals that we can send again to go back to that point that we are uh, demanding really products and services that help us decarbonize. We can't do this alone. We know that that's why it's a pledge. Um, when we announced the climate pledge, we announced the largest ever order of electric delivery vehicles. So we partnered with a company called Rivian. We ordered 100,000 vehicles, which will begin deployment this year. Um, and we'll scale that electrification. Um, the infrastructure pieces of that, incredibly complex as well. Uh, not just the vehicle itself, which is innovative, but um, how do we then transform our infrastructure to support electrification of a fleet? And how does that extend to everyone beyond us? Um, we also partnered with Mercedes-Benz who has signed the pledge and ordered uh, 1800 EVs in Europe, uh, which is their largest ever order of electric vehicles. So we're both sending those signals that we want this, we're placing those orders, driving that demand, hopefully driving scale as well. Um, we know that our middle mile business, also our operations um, is a really tough thing. So this comes with a very unique set of challenges. And unlike our last mile delivery network, um, you know, we have a, a plan for our cargo to be transported potentially further distances, which requires specific equipment and charging and infrastructure that looks different. Um, air and line haul cargo are two parts of that. And so to find sustainable alternatives to work um, on innovation within those industries and accelerate the transportation is really challenging. Uh, last year we did, um, Oh, I don't know if it's last year. I'm, I'm confusing this year. It feels like a very long year, but let's just say last summer, uh, we uh, secured um, sustainable aviation fuel. So we partnered with our Amazon air business and we secured 6 million gallons of this sustainable aviation fuel um, as an enabler of its production, right? So again, one of those signals as the fuel industry looks to see, is this going to be something companies want? Um, and we're introducing our first battery electric trucks to our trucking fleet and deploying more than 450 of those trucks on compressed natural gas instead of diesel. So we're really proud of these kinds of investments as well. They're tangible, they're visible, they're sending strong signals to really scale up um, sustainability uh, and investment. And we also have a climate pledge fund, which I can talk about in some of the investments that we're, we're making there. Okay, yeah, that, that's incredible. I mean, you really have the purchasing power to be game-changing in terms of establishing new sustainable businesses. So that's really exciting to hear. Uh, so we, in the beginning, we started with a quiz about 42% uh, renewable energy that you already have. Um, could you say a little bit more about your plans going forward and what's your strategy regarding renewable energy? Sure. Um, another area where we've been uh, focused for a while, but we're ramping up quickly. So when we launched the pledge, um, we committed at that time, uh, again, September 2019, uh, to reaching 80% renewable energy by 2024 and 100% by 2030. Um, this is one of those things that I think is really interesting about also the data, the systems, the information that we have now generated alongside of these commitments. We took a look at that path and we thought we could actually, I think we could go faster. So right now we think there's a path to getting to 100% by 2025. Um, and as of the close of 2020, we were the largest corporate buyer of renewable energy. So we've really accelerated along those lines. We've done 127 renewable energy projects. Uh, that's, that's projects, if, if those of you are uh, wondering, you know, size, it's a capacity to generate about 6,500 megawatts of energy an annually, which is, again, another way to think about it. It powers about 1.7 million US homes. Um, and these are large utility scale wind and solar projects. We also put solar on our fulfillment centers. Um, they supply renewable energy for our corporate offices, fulfillment centers, our AWS data centers, um, and really help us to get to uh, net zero by 2040. So we are working with so many companies across the globe um, to really you know, deploy these projects. It's different in every region. Um, and so that's complex. We need to know about the grids. We need to know about the policies. We need to know about what it, you know, what's available to us in terms of projects in every region. That's incredibly complex when you think about going beyond, um, you know, what we already know in the U.S. And so depending on those specific projects, um, you know, we deploy different solutions. 
Um, that's similar for our own fulfillment center, um, you know, depending on the project, the time of year, factors, the, the size of the, the solar system um, on top of the rooftop, you know, that can, that can range in what that provides to that energy facility needs. But it's, um, a, it's an area that we feel like, again, we can send strong signals in and we have been, and um, we're really excited about what's happening in that sector as well. Yeah, that, that's really exciting. Yeah, so, so Stanford has also really committed to renewable energy and by uh, 2022 will be 100% renewable energy. We're already at about 60% or so. Uh, and uh, on our last uh, acquisition, we've also added some energy storage. So it's great to see that uh, lots of people are doing this. So anyway, E, back to you. Yeah, thank you, Sally. Well, Kara, this is fantastic. Um, so I want to compare now and uh, about 20 years ago, right? Uh, a little bit, just looking at, uh, you just mentioned about uh, renewable energy, mentioned about <clears throat> solar cells. If I look back about, well, that's 18 years ago, when Stanford started uh, maybe the first energy, clean energy center, a global climate energy project later becoming the pre core Institute of Energy, right? This whole process. Well, if you look at about 18 years ago, the uh, solar electricity cost is so high. Now we are really getting to very low. Then you look at the electric car 20 years ago, unthinkable, you know, electric car will be everywhere. Now we have electric car you know, on right here locally around Stanford campus. Um, <clears throat> percentage is very high. So we start to see technology area, each of these component, you know, generation right, usage, transportation. This all coming up as individual component, very promising. It's really the now, you know, fast forward to now, uh, an exciting time to think about the whole energy ecosystem, how to design it. I want to come back to the big data you mentioned earlier, earlier on. Um, the global carbon reduction really need very deep decarbonization of the whole supply chain. Now it's very exciting time and also challenge to design the whole energy ecosystem. Now, big data of utilizing AI is going to be the key in addressing these uh, global redu uh, carbon reduction problem at scale. Here at Stanford, uh, we are looking at launching a major effort around energy, climate, AI, utilizing big data and machine learning to plan for the whole energy ecosystem and also to map out the carbon footprint and climate patterns. So Kara, you, you mentioned quite a bit about that already. So what opportunities do you see for universities like Stanford to work together with the company, companies like Amazon to achieve uh, yours and, and others sustainability goals? Yeah, thank you for that question. I, we're really excited about this space as well. And I think it's a phenomenal um, role for universities to play. It's it's a we need universities stepping into this, and we need you know really big initiatives, partnerships um, with folks who have expertise in these areas. We're we're looking for that. Um, I can give you a couple of examples, maybe about some of the things that um, we are leaning into in this area, and and I think you know figuring out how all of us come together to really map out. Um, utilizing available climate data, utilizing new technologies, but also thinking about where are the gaps? What do we need to build, right? On the innovation side of things, what are, what are we need that is not available to us now? Um, we started something a number of years ago called the Amazon Sustainability Data Initiative. It's a partnership across a couple teams, including mine with teams at AWS to really accelerate sustainability um, research and innovation, uh, one of the things we were seeing is that um, there were isolated data sets, large petabyte level data sets um, in different areas and uh, being hosted on, you know, on, on various servers around the world. Um, they were at times difficult for researchers, academics to access, um, particularly in areas that did not have great um, compute power and um, areas that were, you know, take weeks sometimes i was even hearing months to download data and you know and analyze that and utilize it so 
Um, ASDI really supports these innovators and researchers with data and tools and technical expertise by moving a lot of these data sets to the cloud. We host them in an open data environment. Um, and what we also are starting to see is the synergies now as we put these data sets in that environment, people are seeing new insights um, as they're seeing those, those data together and they can um, connect them and, and do new analytics and, and find um, you know, new ways of looking at issues. So we work with university researchers, uh, local governments, federal agencies, um, startups, all of these organizations to, to help them leverage ASCI. Um, also to really help them and many times, whether we're talking about um, our partners uh, you know, all over the world to help them understand cloud computing. Um, and train them up on how to utilize cloud computing. So um, I should give you a couple maybe concrete examples of that. Uh, we have um, you know, work with NOAA and NASA and the UK Met Office and the government of Queensland um, to identify and deploy these kinds of data sets on the AWS cloud. Um, these include weather observations, forecasting data, hydrological data, satellite data, climate projection data, uh, air quality data is important one, ocean forecast data. Um, and these data sets are available to anyone. And there, there are case studies now that have been written and are available on our website about things that people have done with the data, ideas, um, projects that are underway. We work with um, a group called the Group Earth Observations um, that offers research uh, organizations access to AWS cloud services and help countries realize the potential of Earth observations for sustainable development purposes. So again, maybe bringing in social and economic data to this. And Digital Earth Africa, um, which enables, and one of my favorite projects, enables African nations to track changes across the continent and really look at unprecedented levels of detail um, around earth observation data and gives you insights into flooding and droughts and soil erosion, coastal erosion, agricultural forest cover. So things that we know are contributing to our ability to manage climate change, you know, land use and land cover change, uh, water availability and quality, uh, changes even to human settlements. So um, when we work with those kinds of organizations and, and allow them to see that those inputs then can drive the right types of public policies, the right strategies. Um, and we work with clean energy startups, of course, as well to produce sort of real time historical forecast data, um, you know, around uh, the world. And then we utilize a lot of these insights in our own business. So I think projects like that uh, are growing. The partners are growing. Um, they're growing in scale and size and geographic diversity, which is interesting. And I think um, climate is such a complex issue. Finding ways to kind of have those partnerships and, and come together and share data is so incredibly important. Yeah, thank you, Kara. Well, just to uh, update you, I think you might already know, maybe the audience here already know. Um, you know, Stanford evolved from an uh, energy project to energy institute uh, having that. Now to, we are planning a new school of uh, climate and sustainability. You can see the uh, commitment from university side to fight for the, uh, <clears throat> fight the climate change to, to maintain sustainability. So this is very exciting. Uh, 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 academia and industry and government and also NGO working together is just fantastic. Now, let me pass uh, back to uh, Sally. Okay, um, so, uh, so Kara, we started off with the, the um, climate pledge and, and you described that as having three major components. The first was mapping, measuring and reporting uh, emissions. And we've talked about that. The second one was to decarbonize uh, operations. And we talked quite a bit about that. But the last point you mentioned was uh, natural climate solutions or nature-based solutions. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about nature-based climate solutions and, and the Right Now Climate Fund and, and what's Amazon doing in, in this space and what do you hope to accomplish and maybe give us some examples. Sure. Uh, this is another area where I would say we are in a very in-depth learning mode. Um, and have been since we started the climate pledge alongside of the pledge. Um, I mentioned a couple of things that we've announced on goals and um, vehicle purchasing, but we also started something called the Right Now Climate Fund, um, which we committed $100 million 
to to understand, support, and really begin to um, build a more credible uh, landscape and mar potentially marketplace for natural climate solutions. So we know people care very deeply about their communities and their land, and that one of the best things we can do is to preserve the natural world. So we put this money um, into a, a partnership with the Nature Conservancy. Um, we've started hiring forestry scientists of our own and building a team as well. Um, but really what we want to do is start deploying funds immediately to take action to remove and avoid carbon emissions by supporting these uh, natural climate solutions. This is not about um, us you know, deploying offsets right now. We're not doing that. We're thinking right now about how do you support this community, which has had various kind of challenges with credibility, but conservation and restoration and improved land management, um, actions that really increase the carbon storage or avoided greenhouse gas emissions in our forests, our wetlands, our peatlands, our grasslands all around the world are just such an incredible part of this work. And um, We've been working on these projects. Again, the language is reflected in the pledge, but you know we wanna conserve and restore and support these sustainable forestry and wildlife nature-based solutions. We wanna deploy technologies that help us to uh, monitor the permanence of them. This is not really a role, a role for a corporate, and this is my, my view, is to support this work. Of course, there's experts in multiple different NGOs, um, multiple different conservation organizations that, that know this much better than us, but we think it's a part of our work uh, on climate change. And so uh, we've deployed uh, two grants so far, our investments. Uh, one was $10 million um, to uh, nature-based solutions across the Appalachian Mountains. And those projects are uh, helping to conserve and sustainably manage forest land uh, and wildlife in Pennsylvania and Vermont, um, and plans to expand the projects across kind of another 4 million acres of the 2,000 mile span of the Appalachians and beyond. So they generate sort of economic opportunities which are very important in these solutions as well, because you have to take into account the communities and the, the landowners. Um, so this is a new source of income for family forest owners and rural communities um, so that they can tap into the carbon uh, storage potential of forests. Because in the United States, and this is a, you know, an insight I, I, I learned, I didn't know, um, families and individuals own the largest portion of forests not federal governments, not corporations. Um, so it's really that you've got to bring these uh, smallholders, these family farms into this. And so we're looking to kind of um, achieve a net reduction of 18, uh, 18 and a half million metric tons of carbon in the atmosphere by 2031, um, which is, it, it's a tremendous uh, opportunity and support these local communities with economic development. Um, outside the United States, we've made one other investment to support an urban greening project uh, in Germany, in Berlin, uh, which is using nature-based solutions to help cities become more climate change resilient. So this is a different type of approach, um, but equally important. So helping city officials and local community organizations to create, implement plans for things like reducing flood risk in their cities, improving uh, rainwater retention, uh, tree planting, revitalizing urban wetlands, adapting existing green spaces. Um, these are things that can help to reduce extreme heat and pollution, uh, which is incredibly important in our urban areas, uh, leveraging unused some public spaces to again, plant trees and revitalize those kind of urban wetlands. Um, and in, importantly, also increasing urban biodiversity, which we know is another critical component to this fight. Um, introducing pollinator friendly species, uh, climate resilient urban grasslands and things like that. So these are um, incredibly important uh, components of not only where I think hopefully I've shared a little bit about how we're rapidly and aggressively decarbonizing in our own business, but how are we supporting communities around the world to also deploy climate change solutions and be a part of this. Well, that's that's really encouraging to to hear that you're really thinking about nature-based solutions in terms of the co-benefits to to communities, particularly rural communities, uh, but also uh, in in urban regions where uh, often uh, there's sort of a disproportionate uh, access to you know uh, 
environments that are, are, are very hospitable and, and there are you know big gray areas and the idea that we can start turning gray areas of cities into you know lush green parks and so forth is really encouraging so that's terrific so e back over to you yep well thank you so the conversation so far has been terrific so kara let's uh, start to uh, engage our audience uh, I'm seeing uh, the question, to, there are about 50 questions now flowing in, there will be more mm -hmm. coming. We will not be able to take all the questions, but, but we are going to pick some. So let's have uh, first uh, a couple of questions from our students first. Um, let me uh, bring back in uh, Rebecca and, uh, and also Victoria uh, to really, you know, uh, ask you some of the question from the student standpoint. Um, Victoria, maybe let's uh, start from you. Thank you. I'm, I'm curious, Cara, you've spoken about several sustainability programs today that are really fantastic and many of them um, just depend on, on Amazon, but I'm thinking that there are several programs that depend on the customer as well, for example, when we get that prompt to maybe combine our packages and get them a bit slower instead of having them ship separately. So how do you think about that human psychology side of things and motivating customers to participate when they may not necessarily be focused on sustainability or climate? Great question. And I just want to say for uh, Victoria and the other students, like I, I'm so, I told them before we were, before we were joining this, I'm so excited to see students studying sustainability. I'm so excited with the in-depth knowledge that they're bringing and um, just really impressed with um, the engagement. So thanks for the question. Um, I think there, so there are a couple ways I would think about this off the top and then uh, maybe just give you an example. Uh, one, I think it's our responsibility to make this very easy for our customer. We have a, a saying at Amazon that we're customer obsessed. And I think we should do, uh, we should make the customer experience sustainable. We need to make our, our company as sustainable as, 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 as possible. Um, with these aggressive commitments. And I think, you know, it's really our job to do that on behalf of the customer. Of course, customers do also want to participate in sustainability, um, but we need to provide them with data and information that allows them to be able to do that in a way that also um, lets them make the choices about how they see sustainability. So one point just on the shipping with the carbon system of record and the software tools that we built, one of the interesting insights we were able to get is people usually do connote slower shipping with uh, more with increased sustainability. Um, it's a very nuanced and complex question, actually. And one of the learnings that we had that was a surprise to us as we went in, of course, we have all the data on the different shipping modalities, on the different shipping speeds, what that actually means. And our lowest carbon shipment option is actually our same day or sub same day, which means a one to two hour or same day delivery. Um, which was super surprising to people internally. And it has to do with the fact that mostly when you put inventory closer to the customer, uh, it's a lower carbon footprint. But those kinds of insights help us to, you know, when we think about modalities, um, we know that rail is um, a great, you know, uh, carbon option. We, you know, so we think about modality shifts, we think about inventory placement, those things mean a lot, but it doesn't necessarily always translate to the customer who may just think, if I delay shipping, that's more sustainable. So we want to, we have the data and the information now, we want to start surfacing that uh, to the customer. And then we also obviously sell a lot of products on Amazon. And so um, we wanted to have an option for customers to participate in this. And um, we know it's of critical importance to actively engage customers in, in sort of sustainable shopping practices and all of that. So we launched something uh, last fall uh, called Climate Pledge Friendly which is a program we thought a lot about this and worked on it for a, you know, a, a number of years, but um, we're thinking about how we can make it easier for customers to shop and discover more sustainable products on Amazon. So this goes across our beauty, fashion, grocery, household office, uh, electronics products included, um, both for our um, consumers and our businesses that are customers on Amazon. Um, and so they're badged in the shopping results. Um, you can see addition, you can dig in and see additional sustainability information. And they're also featured in a dedicated part of the store if you want to do it that way. Um, but we thought, uh, you know, how do we do this in a way that's incredible, that's very credible? So we looked at trusted third party certifications um, that already had established sustainability standards. 
So this is a wide range of kind of global certifications. Um, we started with a funnel of about 480 and ended up, um, depending on your geography, but with roughly about 20. And there are things like Cradle by Cradle or Blue Sign. Um, part of this initiative, we also discovered, we, we saw a gap in those externally validated certifications. So we created one called Compact by Design, um, which removes excess air and water so that the products require less packaging and are then therefore more efficient to ship. So at scale, these are kind of small changes, but in, in product size and weight, but they make a significant uh, carbon emission reduction impact when you know you bring them to scale across. So um, you know we know that the customer wants to reduce their environmental or some of our customers want to reduce their environmental impact when they they shop online. Um, we've also done a lot of study and research in our sustainability science team to study uh, you know shopping online and we know it's inherently more carbon efficient than going to the store. So we also spent a number of years developing these models and tools and metrics to kind of understand that. Um, we know shopping online, you know, consistently generates uh, less carbon than driving to a store. Um, a single delivery van trip can take approximately 100 round trip car journeys off the road on average. Um, we have models to look at the carbon intensity of ordering uh, groceries online versus the nearest store. Um, you know, and we know this because we have physical stores, we have supermarkets and we have a, an online shopping business. Um, you know, online grocery deliveries generate 43% lower carbon emissions per item compared to shopping in stores, and then the smaller basket sizes generate even greater carbon savings. So we're really looking into this and thinking about what are the ways our, our customers might want to shop, but also how can we continue to surface this information, um, you know, and inform the conversation. Well, well Kara, I know this information myself is fantastic. I um... I don't do much shopping, but my wife does a lot. So I'll tell her about this data. So <laughs> to be more uh, green and shopping. Uh, let me bring uh, Rebecca in to ask the questions she has. Thanks, Kara. We've talked a lot about kind of the, the transportation aspect of getting packages from Amazon to the consumer. Um, and there's actually been quite a bit of questions coming in from the audience on this topic as well. But so it's been clear that Amazon uh, has put a lot of effort into thinking about packaging. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about the frustration free packing uh, program and give us some insight into that initiative and kind of your thoughts on expanding it, expanding it to, to globally? Sure. Um, yeah, no, no surprise. Um, you know, the most sort of tangible and visible uh, impact, uh, you know, in our business sometimes is our packaging. And so we know it, um, it's, you know, we, we've we tried a number of ways to continue to make progress on our packaging ways to utilize less packaging materials. It's great for the customer. It's great for us, frankly, as well. So it's one of those kind of good win-win areas. Um, Frustration-free packaging started at Amazon uh, well over a decade ago. Uh, it was an idea generated by our CEO uh, and, um, really started with the frustration, the literal frustration that people had when you buy a toy, let's say uh, at the holidays and um, you know, it comes encased in a plastic clamshell and it's got twist ties and it takes forever to open and then it's in a million components and you can't put it together. So it was literally about how do we get things to customers frustration free? This has been one of the more kind of exciting areas too that as I came into Amazon, uh, I've been here six and a half years now and worked with um, our packaging teams and sustainability, the possibilities of e-commerce to dematerialize in general, but, but packaging specifically are really incredible because you don't, when you're in a physical store, the packaging is your advertising. You need to, you know, put all the information on there. There's, you know, colorful pictures, there's uh, embedded security devices. The twist ties are there to keep the product upright on the shelf so that the customer, when they walk by, can see it. When you think about e-commerce, uh, our shopping or anyone who's, who's selling online, um, you can dematerialize all that. So meaning that you don't need all those bells and whistles. You don't need the advertising, the billboard, the twist ties, the, better, the security devices. You don't need the protection. Um, and so frustration-free packaging was about elimination of plastic clamshells and twist ties, 100% uh, recycling pa recycled packaging, easy to open, quick to get to the product. Um, so it's a great customer experience and it's much more sustainable. And so we've leaned into that um, quite heavily. 
And now there are 2 million product, over 2 million products uh, available through the frustration free programs. So these include things that have just been completely reformulated and repackaged to be frustration free. Um, also just things where we've eliminated the Amazon overbox. So if you are um, a young family and you have young kids and you order diapers constantly, those diapers can just come to you in the diaper box. They do not need another Amazon smile box and extra material packaged over it. Um, generally, they're not going to be a gift. Uh, they're, they're not, um, they're not going to be damaged in transit. Uh, that packaging is a corrugate already. So we looked through, again, back to use point, machine learning, uh, AI. We looked through all of our tools and we we're able to go through our catalog and select great candidates for what we call shipped and owned container. If the customer wants to conceal it, we have that option for them if they're sending a gift or something like that. But for the most part, people are happy to not receive the secondary box, right? Just their item. Um, and you know, these machine learning algorithms that help us make these smart packaging choices take into account damage and concessions. But if, because of course, if you damage an item in transit, it's actually environmentally worse. It's better to put minimal packaging on it so that you know that doesn't have reverse logistics, it doesn't come back, it doesn't have to go to the landfill. So we're really careful about these things and the unintended consequences of some of these packaging decisions. Um, but the team has done a great job inventing these machine learning algorithms, thinking about this packaging to right size it for the customer order, um, which translates into fewer trips, uh, you know, less, less fuel burned, uh, more in being able to fit in a truck. So all of these things also have great impacts throughout the entire life cycle and carbon savings. And so we've been working on this since 2015. We've reduced the weight of our outbound packaging by 33%, which is huge on our scale. Uh, we've eliminated more than 915,000 tons of packaging material, which is the equivalent of 1.6 billion shipping boxes. So we are really uh, taking this, you know, and running with it, going at scale. Um, we've also tried to enable our customers the opportunity to learn more about where to recycle. Uh, we have a public site called Amazon Second Chance that any of you can visit, which has ways to refurbish, return, repair products, uh, recycle products and packaging materials. And it's specific to your geography. So you'll see the packaging materials you might receive from us and then where the, the proper disposal um, opportunities are, but also encouraging you to shop for refurbished, reused uh, products. So those are some of the ways that we're, we're tackling packaging. Well, Kara, this is, uh, I think Rebecca is asking, asking ask this question. I personally have a lot of um, experience every Sunday. I will need to, you know, December the cardboard box and, and my house why he pile up like this thick and uh, for the Mondays, uh, you know, trash, uh, trash uh, car to come in to pick up. It's a lot of boxes. I appreciate this uh, frustration free <laughs> packaging. That's, that's a really high impact. So uh, with this, we have a really large number of questions flowing in from the audience. I will let Sally to uh, get the first question to you. Okay, terrific. So, uh, so you talked about electric vehicles, um, really impressive. Uh, so the question from the audience is, um, is about hydrogen. And there's been a lot of work uh, in the last uh, year or so about hydrogen as a source of energy for say heavy duty trucking, or you can also buy hydrogen uh, forklifts that uh, allow you to keep the forklifts, you know, operating, you know, continuously throughout the day because they can be, uh, they can be uh, filled quickly. So we're wondering, um, does Amazon you know, have any plans or interests in fuel cells and, and hydrogen and, and how might that fit into your strategy? Sure. Um, we are uh, very much uh, sort of looking at studying uh, involved with um, hydrogen as a, as a fuel. Um, green hydrogen, uh, you know, to potentially make our uh, transportation operations more sustainable. Uh, we've started actually, we had um, hydrogen fuel cells in our pit equipment, which are the smaller uh, pieces of equipment in our fulfillment network. Um, we've had that for a number of years. Uh, we have an internal hydrogen working group. So we're looking at this uh, and of course, um, thinking about new technology that we're investing in through the Climate Pledge Fund, uh, which I mentioned very briefly, but it's a $2 billion fund we set up last summer to invest in early stage decarbonizing technologies. Um, and we've already made a couple of different investments there, including in Zero Avia, 
um, which is uh, an interesting uh, potential solution in aviation. So um, this is an area that we are, you know, I would say early days on, but very, very interested in. Okay, terrific. Okay, e, back to you. Yeah, I'll co continue the topic, Kara, on, um, you know, on the transportation part. Uh, Amazon use uh, a lot of electrical vehicles now, uh, but it's, they are only as green as the grid can charge them, where the electricity, where it come from. Um, so what's Amazon's plan to increase the percentage of renewables on, on the main grids in order to make the electricity also green to go into the vehicles? Yeah. Um, it's a great question. Something again, we're also you know looking at all the time is greening of the grids, and not only how do we you know utilize our power as a purchaser of renewable energy, but how do we work with policymakers um, in different regions to um, accelerate the greening of those grids, um, and that can be through uh, you know renewable power standards. It can be through utility engagement. It can be through a number of different things, but. We are um, looking at that as well and thinking about our role. And there's a couple of different uh, corporate coalitions as well that um, I, we helped to stand up one at Ceres, uh, which is an EV coalition. Um, we're also part of the Renewable Energy Buyers Alliance, which is looking at this issue and um, AEE, uh, ACOR, which is the American Committee on Renewable Energy. So there's a couple of different industry coalitions, I think, that are coming together, uh, which I think is one of the better solutions for this and saying we need public policies um, to in order to help us green the grids. We'll do our part um, as potential buyers, um, but we're sending signals. We want to see that. Uh, we pay attention to grid mix. We look at that. I will say there is not one really good definitive source of grid mix data. So we're also looking at that. Um, how do you get information you know, about different grids that you're on? So it, it's kind of a combination again of like everything we've been talking about, data, science, policy, and um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the corporate participation as being a buyer. Yeah, back to you, Sally. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, so academics, you know, what we like, we like to find problems that are really hard that nobody else knows how to solve. So, uh, so the question from the audience is that, you know, what are those specific sustainability challenges that, that you find most difficult to tackle? And if you could kind of steer us in the direction that, uh, that uh, we could be really helpful. Great question. Um, the one that comes to mind immediately is on sustainable materials. So thinking about biodegradable materials that can scale for automation. Um, you know, you've seen a number of companies uh, challenged with this kind of materials question. Um, we know that um, we have, you know, we, we want to enable a circular economy. We know also that our municipal recycling systems, particularly in the United States, are quite broken. Um, so by enabling, you know, more uh, sort of looking deeply into material science, enabling more sustainable materials um, and thinking about that is something that we've been focused on. A number of companies have. I mean, I, I look at the work that Starbucks has done on their cup challenge, right? Um, thinking about how do you address these issues of, of waste and, and materials and circularity in, in all of the things that you have. Um, there are some great materials out there, for example, in the packaging space. Um, Corrugate is a great material that generally has recycling enabled, but it's a heavy material, right? So um, when you think about the light weighting that plastic allows you to do, the protective, uh, you know, kind of capability that it brings you, um, it allows you, when you think about that impact all the way through the life cycle, it allows you potentially to have other kinds of carbon savings like fuel transport savings and, you know, truck savings and things like that. But as a material, it's challenging as well because recycling is not generally enabled. Um, so can you get more, can you get different kinds of materials? And then when you think about the sort of biodegradable or other types of materials that are available, they tend not to work in scale because they don't automate well, right? When they get exposed to heat in machinery, they don't, they don't do well. So those are the kinds of like, when you think about the solution, people will say sometimes just use more of this, but the complications, right, as academics are, are probably well suited to research, like where are those pain points through something like that in sustainable materials? Or how do we enable and, and um, better address some of the issues we have in our, our government systems on recycling? You know, we're willing to be a partner. We don't know always, we're, we're invested in things like the closed loop fund and the recycling partnership. We've done, 
commitments to, uh, you know, kind of uh, recycling um, in California, specifically when you think about, you know, the, the mixed use that's going on there. But we don't always know the best places for us to go. And I think academics actually could, you know, play a, a huge role in that. And then there's new areas like we just talked about with hydrogen, where we want to learn as much as we can, as fast as we can, um, about you know where the the best places to play and deploy in that in that are. So I think there's there's so many things <laughs> evolving in sustainability, but those are those are a couple that come to mind. Okay. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So uh, we have um, a lot of work going on in sustainable plastic, where you can take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere that you capture uh, and then make it into a plastic so that, you know, it's sort of yeah. net negative products. And uh, one of the companies, even uh, Manu, uh, we have a small startup that came out and they manufactured um, uh, sustainably made uh, sunglasses. And, <laughs> and there was a trip to Antarctica and the, the explorer wanted to have a hundred percent sustainable product. So he took those uh, sunglasses okay. with him. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, okay, that, thank you for those. Uh, thank you for those insights. Uh, okay, Eve, back to you. Yeah, uh, Kara, let's uh, talk about the carbon price a little bit. So at Stanford right here, since I joined the faculty now more than 15 years, every time I talk to uh, Secretary uh, George Schultz here at Stanford, he keep emphasizing we need to have a price on carbon, right? It, you know, it could be carbon tax, it, but it could be probably something else. Um, and uh, to leverage the uh, playing field between clean energy and uh, carbon-based uh, en energy sources. So there's a question from the audience right here. Put you on spot a little bit. <laughs> Hope you don't mind. Uh, what is Amazon's position regarding placing a U.S. price on carbon at the federal level? Uh, would uh, would Amazon support this uh, position? Well, we're looking at this. So, you know, we've obviously had a lot of debate internally about carbon pricing. We are looking at what other companies have done to also, you know, put a price on carbon internally um, so that we can understand it and nothing more to share today. But, you know, this is something that we're obviously debating and talking about quite a bit. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Sally? Um, actually, I think we're going to go to Rebecca. Yeah, Rebecca, please. Sure. This is a, a common thread between some of the student questions and also several of the of the audience questions. Um, but basically, how are you making your data centers and warehouses more sustainable, both in new build as well as kind of retrofitting what you guys have already built? Yeah. I, great question. I think the built environment, sort of uh, heavy industrial sectors, the built environment is a is probably one of those things which is not just as exciting to talk about in terms of you know some of the other industries that we're we're in but it is one i am super passionate about it it's one of the biggest kind of levers that we can pull to transform that built environment so we're thinking um of course from a data and science perspective first where we've built systems to understand building management systems of course but then also thinking about you know where are um the the pieces that need transformation. So we look at HVAC, we look at refrigeration, we look at building materials. Um, of course, we look at the energy footprint of our buildings as well to be most energy efficient, but the building material space is really interesting. Um, we've made a couple of investments. I'd point you out of the Climate Pledge Fund in this area, which we're beginning to deploy. One is in Carbon Cure, which is a cement product that has carbon sequestration. Um, and we're deploying that in some of our built environment already, particularly in our um, second headquarters in Washington, D.C. area. Um, we are looking at, you know, other things like steel and other building materials, because those have such a big impact in the world, not just for us, but just for everybody. Um, we also invested in a company called Turntide, which is the energy efficient rotor on uh, HVAC equipment, huge energy savings there. So these kinds of things that, you know, we both want to support and then deploy within our network to collect the data and see how they're doing and then, you know, continue to scale up are really, really important. Um, when we think about, um, you know, all of our facilities, we're looking across, not just, again, the footprint, but also, you know, how they're constructed, how they can be more efficient uh, in the data center world, like water evaporation and cooling, of course, is a big component as well in the physical stores world with Whole Foods, it's about refrigerants and where are there more sustainable options for refrigerants because that has an, you know, an impact to the carbon footprint. So um, we're really excited about all the, you know, the opportunities that some super inventive, great companies are coming along with in terms of products and services. We're continuing to, I think one of the best things that we can do is not just invest, 
but deploy, right? And put them in, a, in an environment where we see how they do and then share that data back and continue to scale. So Victoria, you have a question. Yeah, so to your point, Cara, about the balance between investing and deploying, we had a question about the Climate Pledge Fund, and specifically the question was, how does it fit into the sustainability initiative, and what are its key investment criteria? Sure. Um, you know, we I just I mentioned we just started this this summer, so uh, we're just, you know, still early days learning and going. Um, we are first and foremost, the fund is set up to um, invest in decarbonizing technologies that we think will help us at Amazon, but of course, you know, will help the world. Um, so we look at things from, you know, our operations perspective, where our biggest carbon challenges are. Uh, that's why we've looked at things like the built environment with Carbon Cure and um, Turn Tide. We've looked at Zero Avia for, uh, you know, uh, airplanes. Uh, we just made an investment yesterday um, in a, you know, a fuel solution um, that we announced. So um, we've also invested in a company called Pachama, which is interesting because they do sort of satellite monitoring technologies for uh, forests, right? So we talked a little bit about that before. So really, it's a very wide ranging set of things that we're going to look at, everything from agroforestry uh, solutions to um, built environment, uh, transportation, uh, operations and fulfillment kind of solutions, product, and so forth. Um, and we really just want to invest in things we think are going to have big carbon levers. Of course, you know, Rivian and our electrification of fleet is in there as well. Um, there's no set criteria beyond that. There is an intake process. You can go to our website. There's a, you know, on the climatepledge.com and there's a way to, you know, go in there, suggest ideas, um, get information in front of the team. Um, and then we, you know, internally, we have a mix of our scientists and our sustainability team along with our corporate development function who come together. And obviously our skill sets are to look at the, you know, from a science perspective and a sustainability expertise perspective to look at the impact of these potential solutions. And then, you know, the, we do the due diligence from a corp dev perspective as anyone would on, you know, the, the company itself and where they're at. But we really look at any stage company uh, and, and it really, the, the, the focus has been on the prioritization to, and the importance and ability to decarbonize. Sally? Okay, great. Yeah. Anyway, I've just been thinking about some of the things you said earlier and, and the, your comments about the circular economy uh, you know, brought to mind some work that we've just started doing on circular economy for batteries. And with the rapid growth of EVs, you know, I think we're going to at some point start seeing a, a lot of you know, batteries that, that actually can have a very useful second life. And it seems like Amazon is sort of uniquely uh, suited to, you know, on both sides of the, you know, you'll be using a lot of batteries for transportation and, and, and then you'll have an opportunity for repurposing uh, those uh, for, you know, uh, electricity systems uh, improvements. Um, anyway, but that wasn't really my question, but, uh, but I do think, you know, Amazon is a really interesting opportunity to be on both sides of the batteries, both as a first life and second life user, and maybe catalysts also for thinking about second life batteries. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, the question is, <laughs> sorry for that diversion, um, <laughs> that, uh, you know, we have a new administration, you know, it's a new day. Um, and the question is, is, you know, how does Amazon Think about working with the Biden administration, and you know, even beyond uh, beyond the uh, United States, you know, in governments around the world, you know, you're doing so much. You're such a leader. You know, how, how do you think about cooperating with governments? Yeah, I mean, I think first and foremost, we'll cooperate with any government that wants to lean into, you know, combating climate change. Um, so it's it, you know, regardless of the Biden administration or any specific administration, if we're aligned on our goals to accelerate the fight on climate change, that's great. And we're happy to partner in whatever way we can. Um, it is exciting to see the Biden administration come out strong on climate change and all of the attention that's being paid right now to rejoining the Paris Agreement. And I think aligning you know, with those goals. Um, we're certainly talking to them about our goals and making sure that they're aware and that we're a partner. We're, you know, we're leading to the same things. I know um, there was something the other day too about electrification of the federal fleet. 
So I, I think all of those things were, were aligned and we're just wanting to share just like we would with any other corporate or NGO or partner um, how we should do this, what are the best ways? And then, you know, along with our industry partners, be a voice about what are the enabling policy environments that we need to address this. Um, but that's true of what we're seeing in Europe with the EU Green Deal uh, and the focus in, particularly so far, I think on product circularity there. And some of the things, um, you know, that we're, we need these partners to come together. We can, again, play a certain part um, in advancing technologies, deploying them, investing in them, you know, creating demand, but you need that enabling policy environment to make sure one, that everybody can come along with that, right? Because I think this is something the world needs to transform at, not one by one. Um, and then I think also uh, we need to understand um, how, what systems government's going to invest in. So again, the infrastructure pieces I talked about in electrification, are very important pieces for government to really think about, right? That's not something the private sector, I mean, we can invest in infrastructure, but that's that's a government role and responsibility. Uh, same with municipal recycling. Um, we would love to see that, you know, more fully tackled and enabled on behalf of us and all of our customers around the world. Um, that is not something that I think a, a corporate's going to solve. Um, so we can come along with some of the ideas, but in terms of partnership, there are certain responsibilities that I think are fully in the domain of government um, and we're there to partner, but love to know what's gonna happen there. And then, you know, there's other things where the Biden administration is certainly sending a signal right now that um, climate is at the top of the priority and it's, it's a priority for treasury. It's a, a priority for our new transportation secretary. It's a priority for, uh, you know, uh, Secretary Kerry and uh, his whole team that's doing a great job thinking about specifically what the US role is going to be um, nationally determined contributions to the Paris Agreement or deploying policies uh, to change, you know, the practices of the federal government. And that's really exciting to see. Um, and so look really looking forward to that partnership. Okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, Eve, back to you. So, uh, Kara, um, while you're answering Sally's question, I was looking into our attendance list, there are many people, of course, coming from industry, listening to your, you know, uh, what you share. Uh, there are a lot of people from academia as well. And I look at the list, I see my friend, uh, Stan Whittingham, our, our Stanford alumni uh, is also in the audience. He's a, a Nobel Prize winner for the lithium ion batteries. This, this gives you a, a feel of what a mixed audience we have right here. A very exciting one is, uh, of course, we have a lot of students, really a lot of students while right, watching. Even after the event, it is video available. I'm sure there will be a lot more. So I, I want to give you a chance. You, you know, yourself uh, is a role model for many young students. Um, what advice do you have as they are, you know, seeking careers in clean energy or sustainability? So. What otherwise do you have? Well, thank you for those kind comments. But um, yeah, I you know we have the opportunity to talk to students a lot, and um, I think one of the most exciting things for students right now, when you think about the opportunities that are in front of you, when I know when I was coming out of graduate school, I was interested in sustainability. I worked my entire career in sort of, um, I worked for a Senator, I worked for a mayor, I worked in NGO. Uh, I worked uh, actually in an academic consortium prior to joining Amazon. It was a consortium of four universities where all my staff were, um, you know, professors and in academia. So I've done multiple different kind of sectoral approaches to sustainability. And then at Amazon, of course, the private sector approach. One of the most exciting things that students have in front of them right now is the fact that one, if you're interested in sustainability, it is a growing field. Um, and there are opportunities in a multitude of different sectors. And so I think um, looking at, you know, the opportunities within academia, within government, within uh, the NGO world, within corporate um, is fantastic. Two, if you're going to seek a job in corporate um, or in the private sector, you know, what's really, really interesting is I, I sort of spent a lot of time, I think, up front talking about the system that we built and how we want to enable our business operators and our leaders to um, really embed sustainability into their thinking. We have so many sustainability roles that are not on my team. And that is exactly what we want to see in any corporation, which is 
There's a central team, of course, that's going to have to drive it, set goals, set governance, set practices, you know, codify things, um, and drive it throughout a company, particularly as large as Amazon. But look at those roles as you want to learn that are in operations, um, that are in product development, that are in data center infrastructure. And think about those roles as huge opportunities to learn the implementation. So not just coming to the sustainability team, if there is one, but maybe taking a role where you are an advocate for sustainability and you are the driver of sustainability in an incredibly important part of the business. When we find those people who are rethinking how we design our products, uh, reassessing you know, our topology, thinking about how to incorporate climate risk into our planning, that, that is um, the best thing that can happen, I think, to Amazon. And the resourcing of those functions um, is increasing, I think, overall. So when you think about where your scientific knowledge or your coming out and your knowledge of energy markets can fit, I would say think about the, the landscape very broadly and the impact that you could potentially have in a different kind of corporate role through that sustainability lens. Um, I think that's one of the, the more exciting things that we're seeing. And then that experience of doing it and having to execute it and operationalize it, maybe bringing that back into a, a more, you know, policy or central function at some point um, can be very helpful. But I think um, just, you know, the world is your oyster. There is a, there are a million opportunities to you to embed your sustainability knowledge and thinking in a variety of different roles. So sometimes spending some time in a supply chain organization or an operating organization can be very, very valuable. Well, Kara, that was an uh, excellent conversation. Thank you very much for joining us today. And to all of you joining us from around the world, uh, we hope you find today's uh, global energy dialogue informative and relevant during these uh, difficult times. We will now conclude our broadcast of today's program on behalf of the entire Stanford Preco Institute for Energy. And we have Sally, Alun, we would like to thank you for joining us and we will see you next time. Thank you.